Let's begin with prayer this afternoon. Dear Father in heaven, on this beautiful day, we uh, want to thank you for the many blessings you give to us. And it is because you are good and faithful. And we, we as your children, want to thank you for what you do in our lives. Uh, amidst the turmoil that we may have, amidst the difficulties that life may bring to us on a day-to-day -day basis, we want to be reminded that you are faithful and you're always there, uh, whatever may happen to us. And in our class this afternoon, as we ponder the meaning of the health message and the influence that Ellen White had on this message and how you communicated through her, guide us, guide our minds as we have prayed before. Continue to help us understand, but also give us courage and a willing heart to practice what we hear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, well, let's begin here. Okay, let's see how this works. There we are. Okay, all right. Well, my question this morning is, oh, not this morning, this afternoon. If George Washington were alive, that's the President of the United States I'm talking about here. If he were alive, what would he say about the relevance of the Adventist health message? Well, just hang on a little bit, and in a couple minutes, I'll tell you what he would say. Because I think I have a pretty good idea. Someone, some years ago, did a, in fact, it's Dr. Kuhn, the predecessor that taught this course here at the seminary for many years. He did an obituary review of obituaries in the Review and Herald between 1857 and 1863. And here is what he found out in that six-year period or so, that slightly more than a quarter of the people listed in the obituaries died before the age of seven. That another quarter of the people listed in the obituaries died between the ages of 10 and 29. That means, my friend, that were we to live in 1860, half of us would not be in this room. Did you realize that? Yeah. Thus, virtually half of Seventh-day Adventist recorded death during this period died, people, were, people died before the age of 30. Death came very frequently, unexpectedly, and suddenly. What were the causes of death? Mainly communicable diseases, infections in other words, uh, tuberculosis, known also as consumption, is nearly half of the cases. Death was no respecter of persons. Frequently, the funeral services were conducted without a minister, sometimes an Adventist minister, and sometimes no minister at all. And death was a common, frequent, and most unwelcome intruder in most Adventist homes. 200 years ago, Medicine was practiced in a very weird way. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read you a page from Dr. Mervyn Harding. A physician explains Ellen White's counsel on drugs, herbs, and natural remedies. Let me read to you how George Washington died. Most of you have no clue as to what happened to him. But here it is. The death of George Washington offers one of the most dramatic examples of the dangers of early American medical practice. On Friday, December 13, 1799, Washington was exposed to a cold rain. Sometime during the night, he had a bout of violent fever, fever that is uh, ups and downs, chills and hot sweats and so on, back and forth. Uh, with pain in his upper throat, some difficulty in swallowing, and a slight cough. And the fever and a labored breathing followed throughout the whole night. Let me pause. What do you think he had? A flu, a cold. Uh, he had a cold rain. He was, a, uh, he, he was riding in a cold rain. So he got wet, damped. It's December in Virginia, so it is cold. So he got 
a very bad cold and very likely a very bad sore throat and all of this mixed up together. May have been a little bit tired too at the same time. So that's basically I think we think that he had. Washington who believed in the benefits of bleeding sent for a neighborhood bleeder who removed some 13 ounces of blood. Now, how many blood do we give when we go to the Red Cross and we give blood? One pint. How much is that? Eight ounces. That's a cup. Eight ounces that we give. The doctor that night took out of him 13 ounces because they believed that if somebody is sick, it is because the blood is corrupted. Take that away, take some blood away, and then you'll get better. About 11 o'clock Saturday morning, his own physician arrived. He decided to send for two consultants who arrived late in the afternoon. Now, he's the former president of the United States, so we do things well there. So let's, let's ask for more physicians to come along. While waiting for their arrival, he bled Washington twice. The, amount, the accounts do not specify the amount of blood removed, but do record two copious bleedings. He also gave the former president two doses of calomel. Calomel is something to get the bowels going. All right, it's to uh, give the bowels, make the bowels going. Uh, which is thought that if you've got a headache, if you're sick, it's because you're constipated. He applied a blister to the front of his neck and washed out his lower bowel with an anima. So from in, from out... Uh, all his efforts produced no benefit. No wonder. Washington's breathing had become more labored. After the two consultants arrived, the three physicians, after discussing the case among themselves, decided to try another bleeding. This time, they drained, watch out, 32 ounces of blood with no apparent benefit. In addition, they repeatedly gave their patients vapors of vinegar and water to breathe, so that made him sick even more, several doses of tartar emetic to keep him vomiting, and a large dose of calomel one more time to keep his bowels active. He had a large bowel movement, all right, but his general condition worsened. Next, they applied blisters to his legs and a bran poultice to his throat. That's probably the only good thing they did, is that bran poultice. Washing, uh, bran poultice, it's bran that is mixed into water and a paste and put on his throat. It's, it, it draws perhaps the, the, the sores and if there's an infection, but he's got no infection. And blisters, uh, it's, it's, um, it's some kind of a mustard, very, very uh, strong type of things that is put on the skin to make the skin feverish. So blisters come out of that. Washington's breathing became more difficult until he could speak only in whispers. And about 11 o'clock Saturday night, he died. What a terrible story. You're right. What a horror story. They, they killed him. His physicians killed him. That was the practice of medicine at the turn of the century, 200 years ago. So let's ask George Washington whether the Adventist health message is relevant. Were he alive or, you know, if we could run, run back the clock and if things had happened very, very differently, I would say that he would probably agree that here is something good here. That is the state of medical practice about 50 years before Ellen White, before she began to receive messages from God. So that's the context of giving the health message, as far as medical practice is concerned. And I think we're beginning to see some light, aren't we? It doesn't take long. While mortality rates have been materially lowered in the last 150 years, the health condition of the average American is still very seriously at risk. 
The United States, along with most of the Western world, has the highest amounts of cancers of all kinds, diabetes, heart disease-related deaths. The typical American diet is the major culprit in the nation. Sugar consumption has risen 250% in the last century. A century ago, 75% of all protein intake came from plant foods. Now today, it is 75% from animal sources. Things have changed around. In his lifetime, the average American today, 1995 estimates, will eat 15 cows, 24 pigs, 12 sheep, 900 chicken, 1,000 pounds of fish and game, and 26,000 pounds, that's 13 tons, of dairy products. This type of diet, high in protein and fat, low in fiber and carbohydrates, that's the Atkins diet, by the way, and deficient in minerals and vitamins, is a sure prescription for early disease and untimely death. You're following me? You're with me here? Let's add to all of this obesity that has become a real problem in North America, not only with adults, but with kids. A third of kids below the age of 15, 16 are said to be obese. Wow. Why did God give us the health message? Why did God give us the health message? Very quickly, let me go through seven reasons that we might live longer. Whoa, that's a good, that, wow, that's all right. That we might enjoy the years that we have. That we might be enabled to render services to God longer and more efficiently. That Seventh-day Adventists might be a good witness for the remnant church. You agree with all of that so far? Yeah. That we might help non-Adventists find the benefits and blessings of good health. Amen. That our mental perception might be sharpened to better understand secular and spiritual truth. And then, one last one, that we might attain to greater spiritual growth and development. Oh, there is a connection between spiritual growth and health, physical health. There is a connection. Lots of people will say, no, there isn't. Oh, wait a moment, there is. Let, let con let's continue. Ellen White's health message was not always unique. I want you to uh, also catch this here. Adventists were not always the first to teach certain aspects of healthful living. Muslims, for centuries, have said no drinking and no pork. So we're not new in saying this. Mormons, just before us, a couple decades before the Adventist church really got going, did say no drinking and no smoking and some other things like that. So, and no coffee. So it is, you know, originality is not a test of prophecy. Originality is not a test. What is good is the uniqueness of what is trying to be said. And that's what I want to drive at here this afternoon. What is unique about the Seventh-day Adventist health message? New Age people have a health message. Very strong. Most of them are vegetarian, in fact. Strong vegetarian. But what is unique about us? What is it that is so unique? I think that what was unique about Ellen White's health message is its philosophical and theological approach to health. She linked the Christian's physical condition and the spiritual experience in a cause and effect relationship. How one goes, the other one goes too. I think that's what's unique about the Adventist health message. It's philosophical and theological presuppositions. Now what are they? Were I to ask you that on an exam question, I'm not sure you could right now tell me what they are. So let's, let's go through that. I think we have heard a lot about what is the health message. Don't eat this, don't do that, do more of this, less of that. We know the little bolts and nuts, you know, of everything. But how about, what's the foundation of all of this? What is so unique about what we teach? Ellen Wright received instructions from God regarding the health message. And here she says in 1897, I have had great light from the Lord upon the subject of health reform. I did not seek this light. I did not study to obtain it. It was given to me by the Lord 
to give to others. So Ellen White claims here that what she received, or what she communicated to us Adventists, she first of all got it from the Lord. So she did not seek this. She got it as a gift. Ellen White had a few visions, two or three, that are particularly important. Let me go quickly through them. A first vision that talked somewhat about health was in the autumn of 1848. In that vision, God talked to her about the effects of tobacco and also of tea and coffee. It's a very brief vision, not much being said about the health message. But this is where it begins as far as tobacco is concerned. The second one, 1854, is a short one too. There she talks about the lack of hygiene among Sabbath keepers. And she talks also about the need of controlling one's appetite. So hygiene, meaning by this, taking baths, washing, cleaning up the house, making sure that we are clean and having good places to live. So internal, external hygiene. The major vision is June of 1863. A bare two or three weeks after a mere two or three weeks after the general conference was organized. That's a long vision and it has a lot of things. In that vision she learned about the fact that we need to care for health and that is just about a religious duty for us to do that. So she links religion and health together. Most diseases we learn through that vision are caused by a violation of the laws of health. And then she condemns a few things. Stimulating drinking like alcohol, tobacco, highly spiced foods, overwork, and a few other things. For the first time, vegetarianism is advocated by Ellen White. We'll come back to that in the second hour more particularly. Proper, a, proper dietary habits are necessary to control appetite. The control of the mind is essential. Did you know that? That controlling what we think about is part of the health message? Wow. It's part of the it's, it's part of psychological health and mental health. So what we think about, what we contemplate, and therefore the whole thing about reading, about watching some things and so on, that's all part of that idea here. What we think about is crucial. And then she talks about natural remedies and that those remedies are good, perhaps a whole lot better than the calomel and the uh, uh, ematic tartar that we saw with George Washington there. And what are they? Pure air, water, sunshine, physical exercise, adequate rest, fasting, proper nutrition. And then much later, 20 years later, she will add one more, trust in divine guidance. And uh, we have the, the eight natural remedies. She talks also about personal hygiene in that vision, environmental concerns, what you have around your house. If you've got garbage close to your house, it may affect one's health. If you build your house close to a swamp, it may affect your health. And all of these things have been verified today. Those are true. Health education is urged. And then also, we learn through that vision that although these prescriptions are for all people, the vision was specially given for the white family. So you start with yourself and then you pass it on to others. So they needed it perhaps more than anybody else. A fourth vision happens on Christmas Day, 1865, so two and a half years later. James White is coming back. They are all on their way back from spending some time at a health retreat in upstate New York, where everybody, or a lot of them, uh, it's a big party of them there, have had uh, major health issues. James White has had a stroke, his first one, and they've gone to this health retreat uh, to try to get some rest and some cure. And God told Ellen White, get out of there. It's not necessarily the best place for all of you people to be. Some of the thoughts and principles taught at that health retreat are not the best ones. On the way back, they're stopping in Rochester, New York, where they used to live 10 years before that. God gives them a vision. And in the vision, Ellen White knows, receives from God, the urge to establish health care institutions, not only to provide for spiritual and medical care to cure some diseases, but also to provide health education. That will be the beginning of the health reformer and also uh, in time of the sanitarium in Battle Creek. But what is the health message Seventh-day Adventists received from Ellen White? What is it? 
What is it about? Apart from not drinking this and eating more of that, what is the health message? Let me give you 10, 10 ideas that highlight what the health message is. Number one, there is a significant link between the Christian's physical condition and spiritual experience. The two are linked together. Here's a thought from Ellen White, Testimonies, Volume 9. The health of the body is to be regarded as essential for growth in grace and the acquirement of an even temper. If the stomach is not properly cared for, the formation of an upright moral character will be hindered. That's quite a thought here. We are what we eat, in other words. The brain and nerves are in sympathy with the stomach. Erroneous thinking, uh, eating and drinking result in erroneous thinking and acting. She makes a connection between the two. We are what we eat. We become what we eat. So if we eat wrong and the bad food or take alcohol and drugs and, and whatever we, you know, overeat and so on, uh, she says that's going to have an impact on, on who you are and what you become. So there's a link, she says, between the two. Have we forgotten that link? Just we as Adventists, have we forgotten that? Number two. Oh, oh no, one more quote. Our physical health is maintained by that which we eat. If our appetites are not under the control of a sanctified mind, if we're not temperate in all our eating and drinking, we shall not be in a state of mental and physical soundness to study the Word with a purpose to learn what says the Scripture. So that's beautiful. There's a connection there. Number two. And that is likely the most important concept of the entire health message. That number two here. The body in general and the mind with its central nervous system in particular are the only medium through which God can communicate with us. How is God talking to you? Through, through you. Through, through what? Our brains. The only place that God can communicate with us is through our brains. And if our brains are not functioning well because of what we do with our bodies, overwork, drugs, alcohol, and so on, whatever it may be, if we're not being careful with what we consume and what we do with our bodies, particularly with our brains, then God cannot speak with us. Sometimes young people ask me the question, would you tell me what's wrong with a casual beer once in a while? What's wrong with a one glass of wine when we go to a very chic restaurant and we're having, you know, a big sumptuous meal and it's a very special occasion? What's wrong with a cup of champagne at a nice wedding? Well, let me tell you what's wrong with that. Is that the only way God can communicate with me is through my brain. And if I drink anything that has alcohol in it, I'm not talking about one spoonful of cough syrup here. I'm talking about drinking alcohol. That has a numbing effect upon my brain from the very first cup that I drink or glass that I drink or half a beer that I drink. From the get-go, it has an impact upon my brain and it numbs it to some extent. Now, of course, three beers... Sick, a pack of six will numb a whole lot more than half a beer. I, of course, I agree with that. But it takes one to start the, the process, doesn't it? And one beer will affect my thinking, will affect my reflexes, will affect my inhibitions, will affect my conscience, will affect a lot of things in my brain. As a Christian, I have committed my life on my day of baptism to follow the Lord Jesus for the rest of my life, to let him guide me, to be my support, to be my friend, to be the influence that I will follow. I want to keep my brain in the best working condition all the time. And so one beer, one cup of wine, one cup of champagne will have an impact upon me. It will. So the only way God can talk to me is through my brain. And what do I do with it? What do I do with my body? How do I treat it so that God can speak to me? Just some things to think about here. Um, 
Ministry of Healing, page 130. The body is the only medium through which the mind and the soul are developed for the upbuilding of the character. Hence it is that the adversary of souls directs his temptations to the enfeebling and degrading of the physical powers. His success here means the surrender to evil of the whole being. The tendencies of our physical nature, unless under the dominion of a higher power, will surely work ruin and death. Number three. I have ten points altogether. Number three. Although we follow correct health practices as a sacred duty, yet in the act of obeying nature's health laws and the basic health principles we have learned, we do not earn our salvation and eternal life. All right? Salvation is not a matter of eating and drinking. We are not saved by what we eat or drink or not eat and not drink. We are saved by what? The grace of God that we accept by faith. In response to the faith that I have in Jesus, I will treat my body the best way possible. To the best of my abilities, I will do that. But that's not what saves me. I am not saved by a fork, a knife, or a spoon. I am saved by Jesus and by His grace in my life. That's how I am saved. So that is also part of the Adventist health message. We believe in that message. It is a good message. But it's not what saves me. Jesus saves me. But in response and in gratitude to God, I want to follow what he tells me. I think that's my religious duty to do that in response to God. Greg? Well, here's how I would put it together. <clears throat> I suppose um, I can treat my body whichever way I want to. It's my own. And in the postmodern world in which we live, people are very much self-centered, and that's the way of thinking that a lot of folks. Who are you as a pastor to tell me what to do, what not to do? I mean, that's, a lot of church members have become that way. So, but I would say, wait a moment. Um, Jesus has saved me. I have received salvation in Jesus, have I not? I am grateful to God for what he has done to me. And so I want to love him. I want to obey him. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, one commandment is to keep my body in good health, the best I can. Uh, we are all at different stages. We all have different physical abilities, health issues, heredity, hereditary tendencies. So we're all a little bit different. So my, my ways of doing things are not your ways of doing things and vice versa. But I want to do the best I can, out of gratitude for God. Not to save myself, and not in order to be saved, but in order to be grateful to Jesus for what he has done. Let me just do a parenthesis here. You had a hermeneutics homework to do, you remember? Uh, <laughs> and, and one basic thought of that homework was, uh, here's a situation where this man is depriving his wife of good food, is fanatic, he's extremist, and Ellen White suggests a lot of good things that she could eat to be in good health. And then she says, well, if there is nothing else, well, you know, uh, a little bit of meat, a little bit of domestic wine, at least, that would be helpful. It's better than nothing. You're starving the poor man, the poor woman to death, and she's pregnant on top of this. So uh, do the best under the circumstances in which you find yourself. That's part of it. That's part of it. I'll say a little bit more about, uh, about, that, a little, about that exercise a little later. We're not our own, here she says. We have been purchased with a dear price. Even the sufferings and death of the Son of God. If we could understand this and fully realize it, we would feel a great responsibility resting upon us to keep ourselves in the very best condition of health that we might render to God perfect service. But when we take any course which ex expands our vitality, decreases our strength, or beclouds the intellect, we sin against God. In pursuing this course, we are not glorifying Him in our bodies and spirits, which are His, but we are committing a great wrong in His sight. Has Jesus given Himself for us? Has a dear price been paid to redeem us? 
And is it so that we're not our own? Is it true that all the powers of our beings, our bodies, our spirits, all that we have, all that we are, belong to God? It certainly is, she answers here. And when we realize this, what obligation does it lay us, honor to God, to preserve ourselves in that condition that we may honor him upon the earth in our bodies and in our spirits which are his? That reflects what I've been trying to say here. It's to give glory to God that we will do this. Number four, the Christian in every act of life seeks to be guided by two great principles. Actively seek to promote and maintain health and good health, life and good health, and do the very best possible in every circumstances in life in which we find ourselves. So do your best. That also is part of the Adventist health message. Do your best under the circumstances in which you find yourself. Somebody living right here in Berrien Springs with Apple Valley Food Market is one thing. If you live in northern Alaska and, uh, you know, uh, the stores are not plenty and so on, that's a different situation altogether. You do your best in the circumstances in which you find yourself. That's a key part of the health message. But who does one best? Me or you? I do it for myself, you do it for yourself. That's part of the health message. I do my best. Now you may guide me and you may give me some good counsels and you know I may seek counsel too, but ultimately I'm the one who's to make the decisions regarding what's best for me. Number five, Christians will strive to follow the principles of true temperance, which is defined as, now be careful here, the secular world does not define temperance that way anymore. But this is Ellen White's understanding of what temperance means when she talks about it. A judicious moderation in the use of all that is good and health producing. And a total abstinence from all that harms and hurts. That is how we as Adventists have approached the issues of alcohol, tobacco, drugs, uh, sugar, uh, caffeine, uh, and good things, uh, pies and cakes, and, 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 and you name it. You know, judicious moderation in what is good. So one piece of pie is okay. The whole pie is not okay. <laughs> all right? So one piece of cake is all right. Too much of it is not all right. Moderation in what is good. That's what temperance means. But the secular world interprets the word temperance as meaning moderation in what is bad. So it's one drink or two, not six. You know, that's, that's the kind of moderation that the secular world is talking about. That's not Ellen White's definition of temperance. For her, it is total abstinence from that which is harmful. Don't touch it, she says. Stay away from it. So why have we been teetotalers regarding alcohol? There we go. That's, that's the understanding. If it harms, it must harm a little before it harms a lot. So the little is also harmful. True temperance, she says in Patriarchs and Prophets, teaches us to dispense entirely with everything hurtful and to use judiciously that which is helpful. Manny? The domestic wine. Here's a, here's a little clue on that domestic wine issue then, the assignment you had to do. In Ellen White's time, the expression domestic wine, which a lot of you did not pursue. You did not pursue that. What does domestic mean? Domestic meant simply that people were doing grape juice and they were canning it, but the way they were preserving it was not very good. And after a few months of preserving that grape juice, it became naturally fermented. Now, the content of fermentation of alcohol is not 12% like we have in wine today. Go to the store, buy a bottle of wine, it probably has 12% alcohol in it. When we talk about domestic wine in the 1860s, we're talking about 2 
or 3% alcohol. That's less than a beer. A beer has about 5% alcohol. It is a natural fermentation. Now, the closer the domestic wine is drank to the time it is made, the purer it is and the less alcohol it has. So it may have only half a percent alcohol, who knows. But the longer it has been kept in the cellar or somewhere without being well preserved, then the more alcohol there is in it. But the basic ingredient is natural grape juice that has begun to turn alcohol. So Ellen White says, at least a little bit of domestic alcohol, or domestic wine, I'm sorry. <laughs> she says to that woman, or to that man, give your wife a little bit of domestic wine, because the, the grape juice is so good for one's health. All right, I wish a, more, a whole lot more of you would have pursued that. You just stopped there, you didn't go any further. There was a whole lot to learn from that little expression. And it wouldn't have been hard to find out. Wouldn't have been hard to find out. Number six. What's the health message? The body can be polluted, defiled, and ultimately destroyed through various bad health habits. Uh, ingestion of harmful drinks and substances, or insufficient physical exercise or lack of it, overwork, without rest and vacation, feeding the mind with impure thoughts, improper posture, abuse of bodily organs by eating too fast or not enough or snacking and so on, failure to employ natural remedies or in sufficient amounts of them. So these are ways that we can destroy our health by abusing our bodies in various ways. She has a long list there. It, this is not a comprehensive list that I'm giving. But those are the types of things that we hear. Don't do this, don't do that. Well, I've put them all here together. They're all there together. Just don't do those. And there's a lot of them. Number seven. God's church has an obligation to establish health care and educational centers to provide for two things. Healing for those who are sick and to do some health education. Why do we have so many hospitals and clinics? We're fulfilling the mission that came from the visions of Ellen White. That's part of our mission as a church. Number, oh, one more, a, a quote here, Testimonies, Volume 1. I was shown that we should provide a home for the afflicted to those who wish to learn and to those who wish to learn how to take care of their bodies that they may prevent sicknesses. What's the health message? Number eight. Wherever possible, healing should be accomplished through natural remedies. And here's the New START acronym. Nutrition, exercise, water, sunlight, temperance, fresh air, rest, and trust in divine power. The New START acronym. Minister of Healing, page 127, she lists all of those natural agencies. Number nine. Well, some of you may say, finally, we get to that. The original Edenic vegetarian diet of fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables is still the ideal diet today. That is part of the health message, too. But I've put it at the end. Dr. Kuhn also did put it toward the end, because I think more things come before that. Yes? Say it loud. Yes. Vegetables? Yeah, good point. Good point. Good correction. Good correction. But the original diet, let's leave it at that, is vegetarian. Fruit, nuts, grains, and then later vegetables are added as roots or, or stems of, 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 of plants and so on. As far as flesh food is concerned and certain da dairy products, they are increasingly undesirable and unsafe for human consumption. Ellen White tells us, stay away from them. And when flesh articles are removed from the diet, adequate nutritional substitutes must be provided. So that's, that's key there. It's not 
one without the other. The two of them go together. We will come back to vegetarianism in the next hour. Number 10. And this is one that is very important too. Listen to that one. In seeking the reform of others, attitude may be even more important than precept. The greatest patience, kindness, courtesy, tact and discretion must be exercised by the health reformer at all times if he or she is to be truly effective in exercising a positive influence for good on other people. Listen to Ellen White. Of all the people in the world, reformers should be the most unselfish, the most kind, the most courteous. In their lives should be seen the true goodness of unselfish deeds. The worker, the health reformer worker here, who manifests a lack of courtesy, who shows impatience at the ignorance or waywardness of others, who speaks hastily or acts thoughtlessly, may close the door to hearts so that he can never reach them. Wow. Here's another one. Those who understand the laws of health and who are governed by principle will shun the extremes both of indulgence and of restriction. Their diet is chosen not for the mere gratification of appetite, but for the upbuilding of the body. They seek to preserve every power in the best condition for highest service to God and man. There is real common sense in dietetic reform. Common sense, she says. The subject should be studied broadly and deeply. And no one should criticize others because their practice is not in all things in harmony with his own. It is impossible to make an unvarying rule to regulate everyone's habits. And no one should think himself a criterion for all. Hear, hear. Ellen White said that. Yes, you're right. So to conclude. The health message is more than vegetarianism, although it certainly includes it. That's, number, that's one of it. It is more even than the broad question of diet and nutrition, though it includes these two. Don't forget those. It embraces a total concept of wellness, lifestyle, including, among other things, physical exercise, mental hygiene, what we think about, it is concerned with the prevention of disease, not merely its cure. It embraces the maintenance of good health as well as its recovery. The health message is all of that. It's all of this is the health message. Oh, how we need to embrace it and really follow the light that God has given us. Let me conclude with a little anecdote from Dr. Kellogg. In 1895, he said this regarding his medical practice. When a new thing is brought out in the medical world, I know from my knowledge of the spirit of prophecy whether it belongs in our system or not. If it does, I instantly adopt it and advertise it while the rest of the doctors are slowly feeling their way. And when they finally adopt it, I have five years start on them. On the other hand, when the medical profession is swept off their feet by some new fad, if it does not fit the light we have received, I simply do not touch it. When the doctors finally discover their mistake, they wonder how it came that I did not get caught. What a testimony to Ellen White and to her help and the light that she has passed on to us. Here's Dr. Kellogg, before he began to apostatize and have difficulties with Ellen White and the church, what a testimony that by following the health reform, by being absorbing the principles, we may be above the secular world and do even better. My personal testimony on that would be this. About five, ten years ago, we began to hear about this Atkins diet. Lots of proteins and no carbs. Immediately, I said to myself, this is not what Ellen White would say. She would say exactly the opposite. She would say lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, good bread, nuts, 
and exercise, of course, and the rest. But as far as nutrition is concerned, all of those are essential. Protein, of course, we need some, but not so much as to emphasize meat and, and, and fat and so on. And so I thought to myself, this is a fad and this thing shall go too. It will not last too long. And I kept teaching that. Every time I gave a lecture to church members at camp meetings on the health reform or in class like this here, I would say, just wait, just wait. Ellen White is not in favor of the Atkins diet. Just wait. And sure enough, within the last year, so much studies have come out to say that it is not a valid nutritional diet. It is not a proper diet. It causes more harm in the long run than it does benefit in the short run. Yes, people did lose weight within a year or so, but after that, that's when the problems begin. And so it's the whole message that is important, not just one of little aspect of it. Well, let me pause. Maybe I have time for a question or so. Any questions? Did Ellen White uh, say anything in regards to bleeding and how those, would that be in practice in her lifetime as well? And did she speak against it? Uh, what? The bleeding. Uh, oh, the bleeding. Oh, the bleeding. Good question. Yes, bleeding was being done in Ellen White's time. You know that, uh, I think I'm not mistaken here, but my memory is a little vague. You know that Ellen White's oldest son died at the age of 16? He had some kind of an infection, got pneumonia or something like this, bronchitis, and he got sick. He was bled before he died. They practiced bleeding on him. Ellen White had received the health reform messages before uh, Henry died, but uh, they didn't know enough yet as to how to, you know, just do some hydrotherapy treatment to, uh, to heal from such infections, and uh, they bled him. So that was practice in her days. Did she speak against it? Yes. After her son died? After, after, after it matured in their thoughts, yes, she did. Let's take our break. Let's come back at the half hour. <laughs>